you know, the, the videos, we, we've been getting emails from across the nation and uh, literally around the world of those that are watching us now online. And we just got an email yesterday morning from Spain, somebody from Spain watching our service. And so I'm telling you what, I, I just, I'm so excited and hearing what's going on with that. And so um, we're accelerating things that we've been wanting to do on our website as fast as we can uh, because we didn't realize we'd be launched like we have been. Um, you know, and, and just a matter of one week, we had almost 3,000 views. And, you know, that's just not something we've ever um, done before. And so um, with that, uh, would you guys like to hear some good news here tonight? Well, what really made my week was Sunday morning, uh, the healings that broke out in the faith factory amongst our children. And so uh, what I love, too, is when the, there's a healing and a miracle that's visible, that you can that you can actually see. And so Sunday morning, uh, when there was a girl's leg that grew out, the children got to see with their very own eyes um, of, uh, of a girl's leg that grew out. And that just made my week right there because I think that is so precious. That's my heart's desire through all this that we're going through as a family and as a church. Uh, that's my heart's desire is for the children to see that we serve a healing and miracle-working God. And so... Uh, I'm really happy about that. Um, also, for the, uh, for the Heroes Foundation this week, we've met with uh, some people that we had a pretty good meeting yesterday. And uh, we actually had a builder donate a custom-built home to the foundation. We are going to be raffling off between two and $250,000 home that's just a lot. You can custom-build anything however you want it built and it's in a brand new subdivision in granite city we're going to be raffling off that house that all the proceeds is going towards the heroes impact foundation and so uh, i thought that was some pretty good news too right there and so i'm stoked i'm excited about it and uh, i you know when you go into something like this there's lawyers that are involved there's a board that's involved and so i'm making sure i i can't be on the board so i can win the house you know so that's uh so so we're gonna be uh uh jumping into this as well so that we can get this house raffled off and um and if it does not meet the standards or the quota of tickets sold then it becomes a 50-50 raffle. And so whoever uh, obviously is the winner, it's going to be a blessing no matter what. Anybody like a, to have a brand new $250,000 home? And uh, I know I, that would be a wonderful thing. So, and um, so, you know, in meeting, uh, we had a meeting with the, the architect as well and just going over the designs for our new facility that's going to be here on the property. And uh, we got a lot of great things that are really moving quicker faster than i expected and so um you know what I, I don't know what god has in store but i'm just excited to see it unfolding and coming to pass and so um uh, tonight as we get ready uh to give and to plant our seed for those uh, with tithes and offerings and um obviously there's a way of giving online as well uh, over the website if uh, that's what your heart is led to do and uh, we're just uh, excited to see um, what God is doing here. I, I just know we, we planned all along for a big celebration this year uh, with Gregory. And when things didn't work out the way that we were believing and expecting, we're still going to have a great celebration. And that's what this conference is about. So um, we're, we're just ready to celebrate. And I know you guys are too. And, and um, one of the stands that we've made, obviously, is not just the normal, uh, maybe what we consider normal church on the street corner holding bake sales and um, um, just doing good things. But uh, we've got a heart for the prophetic ministry for our city. Uh, we've got a heart for, obviously, healings, signs and wonders, and the miracles for our city as well. And so that's why we're pushing forward with this conference. And uh, how many were here last time John Paul was here with us last year? Uh, wasn't that amazing? And, and I loved, now, and, and, and Dix, and I'm taking too much time on the announcements here. I said I don't like them, but uh, uh, I can't tell you how close Dixon is to my heart. 
and what he's done uh, for me personally over the past few months um, is just gone beyond the call of duty of a friend, a father, and a man of God. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to them coming back to our city as well. Um, for those that need help with the uh, Thank you for joining us in today's service. If you would like the opportunity to give, go to gatewayfamilychurch.com. Then click on the tab About Gateway. There you'll have the option to give online, where you can have your opportunity to give your tithes and offerings conveniently online. Stella, you got a set of lungs on you. Did you ever know that? I mean, I could hear you over, she ad-libbed uh, her own to that new house being built as well. So she's, uh, she's, she's declaring already. And so, so that was good. Um, go for it. You know, that's what we say. So uh, <laughs> you know, I can't stop. Somebody stop me. We have also a 5K run for Gregory that is also in the process of being done in Forest Park. So we've reserved Forest Park, okay? They, they have given us favor and said we could do whatever we want. <laughs> so beyond a 5K run, we have decided to take our liberty and we just thought how incredible it would be. I've been wanting to do this for months. I look out the window and I see Forest Park. And talk about a night of worship in Forest Park for the city of St. Louis. And so, um, you know, we've been talking with some different worship teams over this conference coming up. Uh, from Jason Upton to uh, Rick Pino, Corey Asbury, the, uh, of course Stephanie Frizzle. These are some of our worship people we've been speaking with. So... If we don't have them for the conference, we're definitely looking at bringing in somebody for a night of worship in Forest Park. And uh, since they've given us a, a liberty, we're excited for that. And, um, and uh, it'll be a good time because it's, it's going to be at the beginning of, of October, so it won't be too hot. And uh, we'll, just, we'll just rip open the atmosphere of Forest Park with declaring worship for our God. And I'm just believing that healings and miracles are a part of what will happen at a night of worship as well. And so, you know, I hear, I didn't think, you know, you can read your bulletin as well Sunday, but, you know, I just thought I'd let you know. And it's so good to see Miss Mia here tonight. I'm so glad to see you. And uh, she is just, so, yeah, we're just such good friends. And uh, I just love her so much. I, I got... <laughs> I got to watch my son, though. I mean, all he has been talking about is Miss Mia. And so, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what we're going to do. Um, they all, uh, if well, anyways, my son, the, my daughter loves to make a joke out of it. But we'll ask who his girlfriend is, and he says Mia. So I, I, I'm talking about Judah here. So. Yeah, he's already got a girlfriend, and so I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I, sorry, Chad. I um, <laughs> sorry. Hmm. Anyways, are you guys ready for the word tonight? <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your voice, God. That uh, you would just open up our hearts that we can hear what you have to say to us, God. Lord, it's, it's your word that uh, brings life to us. And we just thank you, God, that what you are doing in our life, beyond what we can even see, we just thank you for opening up our hearts here tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 Now, I'm going to share with you some things um, from my heart. I want you to understand that just because I'm sharing this to you does not mean that I've obtained what I'm talking about. 
we are all a work in progress. Amen? But seeing Him as He is is so important in our life. And our view of, of God, just how important it is. Now, not just seeing Him as He is, but then also how we see ourselves and our journey and our walk with God uh, will bring, uh, make all the difference in our walk with the Lord. And so this is what we're going to go into here this evening as uh, short and as possible. Um, hopefully it does not take as long as the announcements did. Hey, right? But uh, seeing Him as He is and the importance of this. Um, Psalms 27. I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture as we get into... That's something you don't hear too often is turning the pages anymore. Psalms 27 and verse 4. This is a psalm of David where he says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Now we talk about David all the time around here. David holds some keys in his life that we could always learn from. But this is this, the, the decision of his heart, the position of his heart, out of everything that David went through in his life, he said there was one thing. Now there's a lot of times we feel like we are stretched going in all different directions, amen? You feel like how are we going to get it all done? Maybe even a little chaotic, uh, but if we are ever going to be able to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish, we must stay focused, we must be focused and set upon. And David had a focus. It's amazing that the power of a laser is just that it's the focus of a light. Uh, and what happens when something is magnified or focused. Uh, or we, we could just talk about a laser that can cut a diamond just because of a focused light that it, that it presents. The power behind focus. The power behind one thing is, is so incredible. And, and to break it down even to a smaller terms as we can remember when we were the mean kids with a magnifying glass and we begin to think, huh, magnifying glass, sun, Let's look at some bugs, right? I mean, I don't know what comes into the mind and imagination of a child of how cruel that we can be, but what happens when we begin to magnify or the focus of one area, it increases the power thereof. And, and, and so as we look in more of those type of terms, let us think of one thing as a focus. If we were to focus with a one passion, one thing, we can find what David's was, and that was that I may... Behold, the beauty of the Lord. Thank you, sir. That I may behold the beauty of the Lord. Hey, Micah, wave to the nations here tonight. I tell... <laughs> that I may behold the beauty of the Lord. A lot of times it's easy for us to lose the beauty and the splendor. We can all testify to the time that maybe when we first got saved and how we were the radical, crazy person that nobody wanted to answer our phone call or wanted to talk to us anymore because all we talked about was the Lord. You can remember that. And, and you know something that's beautiful about that is I know some believers in the midst of this gathering that they've been saved for years and even decades. And they're still the crazy person that no one wants to answer their phone calls or talk to them unless they're ready for a sermon. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great testimony right there. Do you know that? The best testimony is not the person that left God, went backslid, did all the sin and came back and, and got saved. The best testimony is a person that says, I've been raised in church. I don't, I don't smoke. I don't chew. And I don't hang with those that do. And I'm just as on fire for God now as the day that I first began. That is a testimony that we need to applaud and put upon the magnifying glass is that I was saved and today my passion for Him is greater than when I first began. Because the reality is, the better you see Him and the closer you get to Him, the crazier you're going to fall in love with Him. The closer you get, the more you realize that you don't know, that you didn't see before. And just when you thought you saw it all, you get another glimpse of Him. And that's the reason why the angels are an eternal 
place saying holy, holy, holy. Because they just get these different revelations of the goodness and greatness and the awe of God. That, that eternal beings who understand what it's like to stand in the courts of heaven cry out, holy are you God. Holy are you Lord. And as we look at him, we can see that David says one thing. Have I desired that I will seek after, that I can see, gather, grasp, be able to perceive the beauty of the Lord. Not that I'm around him so much he's become so familiar. Not that I'm around him so much that it's no longer in high definition color, but it's turned to black and white. The beauty of God and the color and the beauty of him. And so often it's easy to get familiar or, or just to get routine or mundane that we lose the splendor, the awe of God and the beauty of his holiness. Psalms 119.18 says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold the wondrous things out of thy law. Behold actually means, I really, I like this definition, this definition is to grab with your eyes. To behold, that I can grab with my eyes, that I can see clearly. Because when I behold him, it moves me beyond my present state of existence. When I can see him, I, it moves me beyond my personality. And you can testify, you can understand, we've all been in places where we would think, how in the world did I do that? It's not my personality. It's not really what I want to do. And I get through some things that normally would have broke me down, caused me to run, caused me to lose it all. But somehow I came through it. How did I do it? Somehow in the midst of chaos, I'm able to behold him that pulls me through Beyond where I am right now. I love Kim Clement. He says, you look a whole lot better in the future than you look right now. And so I'm ready to step into our future, aren't you? I'm ready to step in. And when we behold him, it breaks us through our fears. And when my attention is on him, I'm not so frustrated with my shortcomings or where I go wrong. Why? Because my attention shouldn't be on myself that much anyways. We've all kind of understood by experience of our own testimony or somebody that we know that some of the most miserable people are those that are so caught on themselves and their attention upon themselves. And so we don't need to focus that much on ourselves. Uh, it's not long before we can see our own shortcomings. Amen? And so um, Jesus even asked in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is sitting around having a discussion with the disciples and... Um, he asked them, who do men say that I am? <laughs> who do men say that I... Verse 13. He asked the disciples saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now... Here it is, sometimes it's best not to even ask, you know, maybe you don't even want to know. But in this case, he was asking on purpose. I, <laughs> I can remember one time preaching a message about somebody uh, who was, um, <laughs> who was upset at me and didn't like me too much. This was years ago, okay. Uh, I can remember uh, speaking this message I knew who I was speaking about. And um, after the message, I had three people come up to me asking to forgive me for the things that they have felt towards me. And I'm standing there going, really? <laughs> you don't say. Praise the Lord. All right. So sometimes it's better not even to know. You know, I, you know, you know sometimes it's even better. So uh, I'm just going to assume and pretend like you don't have any ill feelings or thoughts right now. That you guys just keep smiling at me and, and we're good. I don't even bring that up anymore. I learned the hard way. It, it, don't even go there. But Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? And what he gets back is a response I don't know if you have ever realized that these are some crazy responses. Just to let you know, John the Baptist is beheaded. Okay? Who do men say that I am? Some say that you're John the Baptist. I mean, that's, that's not a good, yeah, that's kind of crazy, you know. Some say you're Elijah. And some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Those are some pretty crazy answers that are coming back from 
from him. But the importance was what was getting ready to come forth out of this. And I love it because whenever heaven is asking us a question, it's not because heaven doesn't know, but because heaven is getting ready to unveil. Man, that is really good right there. That's really good. Because, because we all have questions. I've talked about Sunday morning. I've got questions. I'm not, you know, I've got questions that I'm not expecting you to answer. I'm not expecting to answer these questions for you. It may never be this side of eternity that I get my questions answered. But I, I do know that when there's a question risen up in a, in a heart, I think heaven's wanting to unveil something. And in this case, Jesus says, Who do men say that I am? And lo and behold, who's the one that opens up his mouth and speaks? But it's Peter. Peter's never fallen short of opening up his mouth by all means in scripture and he actually gets it right here and he says behold you are Peter said you are the Christ the son of the living God Jesus answered and said blessed are you Simon Barjona for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my father who is in heaven revelation begins to unfold with inside of his heart and I guarantee you Peter did not even realize it Peter did not realize God just spoke to me. But now that Jesus just said it, you can picture, and we can picture in our minds, Peter's shoulders going back. His chest becomes a barrel chest. And, and I mean to tell you what, he is excited because God just spoke to me. We can understand that Peter, I can just picture Peter being excited, but out of his heart comes a revelation. And it starts with the very thing of the focus is, who do you say he is? How do you see him? How is your perception of who he is? And it means everything in our walk with God because some only see him with a certain level of breakthrough that they are available to obtain because of their view of God. Sometimes it's because of the traditions of how we were raised. Some people have a hard time asking God for things because they don't feel like they're worthy or they feel like God's got enough problems. He doesn't need to hear my request. And maybe you felt that battle with that. Everybody has their different views of God as if God is not strong enough, big enough to answer our requests just because there's some things going on in the world right now. Our view of who he is, and some have a view that he's just like uh, a, a, a great big guy with a white beard and a red suit, that we just hop on his lap and give him our request of our uh, Christmas list of what we want. Some have a view of him like that. Some have, everybody has their different views. Unfortunately, it's, it's marred by our experience, by how we were raised, on how we perceive who he is. But he really has this question that he's asking is, who do you say I am? And who we say he is goes beyond the words that come from our mouth. The way that how we perceive who he is is how we act, how we pray, how we walk. These are all definitions of how we see him and who he is. I can see him as who he is by the way that I walk, the way that I talk, and the prayers that I pray. We've talked about this before. I can tell you by your faith, by the level of your prayers. If you're praying the small prayers, it shows you how you see God. I love how um, Rodney was speaking about this pastor that was talking with other pastors and his little son comes up and says, Dad, can I have a penny? Dad, can I have a penny? Dad, 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 can I have a penny? And the, pa the father right away tells his son, Shh, son, be quiet, son, be quiet. He gets him to the side from away from everybody else and he goes, don't you ever ask me for a penny again. That's ridiculous. That's no money. It's embarrassing his father by just asking him for a penny. Ask me for something bigger than a penny, son, especially in front of other pastors. You know, give me a break here, right? Uh, you know, but you know, we're asking God for pennies when he's got a bank account that goes beyond an unlimited amount. You understand what I'm saying? You know, why ask for a penny when his streets are paved with gold? And I'm not just talking about money. You understand what I'm saying. I'm not just talking about finances. But here we find that how we see God is in a result of how we're doing. One thing I find in Hebrews 4.14, this is where it describes Jesus as our high priest. Uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying, he starts it off saying this, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, 
but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. I love this scripture. Obviously, it's one of our favorites, but I, I've never really paid attention to the beginning. That the doorway into this revelation of coming before the throne of grace is what? Seeing. Seeing then. There's something about what we are looking at with our eyes, both natural and spiritual. Um, our view. There's a description in the New Testament in Acts where they had set up all these idols to different gods and then they put one altar to the unknown God. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, we briefly, I shared on this, I think it was, that was Sunday sometime. Um, but in Romans 1.21, I'll just read it again real quick. In uh, Romans 1.21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Because of knowing Him, but not knowing Him. Because of knowing Him, and then when we don't glorify Him, it's easy for us to begin to now change the way we view Him. Our hearts become darkened, our thoughts. So it's not just hearts, but it's, once again, the thoughts and our hearts, the way that we feel. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Now listen, verse 23, how is this possible? They changed the glory of an incorruptible God into the image made like incorruptible men. Changing the glory of God. Human men. How can we do that? It, it, it seems hard to believe, doesn't it? You know, here you have Jesus coming into Nazareth and Jesus holds revival, call it whatever you want, crusades, all over the countryside and miracles are breaking out. Uh, the dead are raised, lepers are cleansed, but Nazareth, it said that he could only do a few healings. Uh, he was limited to what he could do because of their unbelief. And now we find where man limiting God by the view. How can man limit God? Changing the glory of God. You can look, at what, what I find is so amazing, even in the miraculous. Let's just say back in the book of Exodus, when they wake up every morning to miracles. They go to bed every night in their tent to the fire by night. Miracles. They are supernaturally sustained in their life. And yet, through all the splitting of the Red Sea, through all the miracles of getting them out of Egypt, when Moses is on the mountaintop for a while and it's making everybody nervous, what's the first thing they begin to do? They begin to go back to their view of the way they were raised and the Egyptian culture where they had hundreds of idols and hundreds of gods that they served. And now they go back to that by putting their gold and out comes the, the calf, the golden calf. And I just can't imagine Moses. I mean, that's, you want to talk about crazy. Here, with everything you've done, you're up there talking with God and all of a sudden God's like, you better get down there. Uh, they, they, now they've made a, a golden calf. They're having an orgy down there. Yeah, okay, God, that's great. This is, I, I'm so blessed that this is the church that I'm pastoring right now. I'm gone for this amount of time. And now they've already created a golden calf. And it's just, that's, that's a bad day for a pastor right there. That's a bad day for a pastor. So, so he gets down there, throws the Ten Commandments, tab, it's just a mess, you know. I, I just can't imagine. But yet, how we view God, that even though they came out of a miraculous, supernatural way, they still, even though they had come out, there was still an internal view that had to be changed. They still were going back to what was comfortable, to what they knew, to what they were doing. It took them, well, a generation to rise up that was able to walk in a new view uh, uh, before they could get it. The way that we see God and the way that we see ourselves. And see, here's what's so important as our point of view is because when you look in the garden again, like we talked about Sunday morning, 
that the enemy came into a perfect situation of a garden, perfect communion and communication with God, and he knew the only way to disrupt it was to break the communication, and he does it by a lie. God's trying to hold something back from you. God really doesn't want you to eat of this tree because uh, then you're going to be, now we're already made in his image, but when you eat of this, then you're going to be like God. And so he begins to twist and turn with the manipulation, with lies and deceit, and creates them for the first fall, believing a lie of the enemy. And now because of the sin, now of the sin, now they see themselves in a way they've never seen themselves. And now they begin to try to cover their sin by sowing fig leaves together in this garden. And now we find that what they, uh, because of the sin and how they viewed themselves, what they should be running to when the voice of God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day, or in the part of the day, that, that what they should be running to, they were now running from. And this is always a result, listen to me, this is always a result when we are believing a lie. At any point in time, we should be running towards God instead of running from Him, is because somewhere, somehow, we are believing a lie that the enemy has told us, and now the very thing we're embracing, we're hiding from. Whether by guilt, whether by shame. It may, it may not be a lie that we did sin, but the lie is, I love God, who told you that you were naked? Who told you? I want to know who told you. As they begin to describe, now they're fumbling over themselves with excuses of the other person's fault of why they blew it. But God is trying to unveil and unfold and now they're sitting here and they're running in shame from something that they've never run from before. It's so important how we view God because in the way that we view God also mirrors image in how we view ourselves. And knowing our identity is found in how we know His identity. And so when we're going through some crazy things in life, like I said, I've not mastered, how do we see Him? And in our times of trials that we go through the storms and the times of chaos, we must at that time more than ever refine, redirect our focus on how we see Him. And all the moments of chaos over the past months, this was something that I was tr continually keeping my heart in a position of saying, God, I thank you. Open my eyes so that I can see what you're doing. Open my ears so that I can hear what you're saying. God, I want to see what you're doing. God, help me to be able to look beyond my circumstances because there are times in our life when we can't see God doing something. There's times in our life, maybe if you're in the middle of a storm and that storm cloud is between you and Him, or maybe you're walking on the water and there are waves that are crashing. There is a wind that is blowing. And we know that we're supposed to keep our eyes on Him. But in regards of all the chaos of the storm, we must see Him, and when we don't see Him, that's when we walk by faith and not by sight. And when I don't see, I step into a place of faith, of going not but what I see, but what my heart cries out, saying, God, I know who you are, regardless of my experience, regardless of my situation. And how do I see Him? will make a big difference in our journey. Because now when I see Him, as we close, we find that in 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that we shall appear and we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him, listen to this, as He is. We shall see Him as He is. And what, what, what He's saying here is we become, as we see Him as He is, we are changed into the same image of our destiny and our purpose as we keep our eyes focused, set our affections upon the One. And as we see Him as He is, we become to be manifested in the sons and daughters of God that we are called to be. And now as I have a clear perception of who He is, I become who I'm supposed to be. As you see Him as He is, we become who we're supposed to be. I hope it makes sense. Everybody's standing tonight.
Jesus is asking, who do you say I am? Father, it's our heart's desire here tonight that you rearrange the places of our hearts that are out of order. We thank you for making the crooked places straight in our line of vision. Taking every stigmatism out of our eyesight. Lord, heavenly contact lenses to see through heaven's eyes. Lord, we do not want to be deluded in the way that we see you and we don't want to walk out the lie of how we see ourselves. Father, this is our heart's desire that we run to embrace instead of running from the areas of our heart and our life. That's our heart's desire to see you as you truly are. Open our eyes. Keep our position as the one thing that we desire is to behold you in your beauty. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. If you're here tonight and you have any type of place in your heart, you want to make a fresh commitment to Jesus, if you have pain in your body, and uh, we're just going to be here at this altar uh, with, with heaven's activity. If you need prayer for anything, we just invite you to step out of your seat as the ministry team comes. and We're going to be up here praying for you. You're welcome to stay and worship with us as we close. We're just going to end this service with some worship and some ministry. Otherwise, we love you so much. Um, juvenile diversion has been postponed for those that are volunteers. Uh, we're, we were scheduled for this Thursday. That's been rescheduled. Uh, into August, just to let you know. So we'll see you either through the healing rooms or we'll see you this week Sunday. We love you guys so much. Let's worship. Step out of your seats now. Come for any of those of you.